Uh, as an American, I'm very flattered. You guys send us cars and steel and computers, and we send you back pieces of paper with dreams printed on them. From my point of view, this is a hell of a trade, and it's very flattering, but why do you do this? The gold stocks will run again. They will. You have to be a contrarian or you are going to be a victim. The investors who do the work now and act on it before the gold run, the equivalent of the investors who invested in gold stocks in 1971, before the market found out about them uh, in 1974 and 1976, are gonna be the people who make money. I own gold because I'm actually afraid, afraid that in US dollar terms, the gold price is gonna go to $7,000 or $8,000. When will mining stocks start to outperform again? And what does it need to get more younger people into the mining space? My name is Jan Wilhelm for Axino Capital and with me is Rick Rule of Rule Investment Media. He's been investing uh, in the gold and resource space for decades and he has been quite successful as well. Rick, it's very good to have you here. It's a pleasure. It's certainly a pleasure to be with you. Uh, and I'm very interested in the questions that you're prepared to address with me. So it's a particular pleasure to be having this interview. It's a particular pleasure too, to be talking to the German audience, which has been so important for the last at least three decades uh, in financing extractive industries on a global basis. Absolutely, absolutely. And as you already can hear, and as we already said, I do have a German accent. That's because I am from Germany. And maybe we just start uh, there with a, let's say, economic uh, topic. To me, our economy and our decisions of our politicians, obviously, that all looks stupid to me. I mean, we've shut down nuclear power plants and we don't have a plan B. But what is your view on, on the Germans and the German economy? I mean, you live at the other side of the planet. Um, does it look so bad for you too? I don't think Americans, to begin with, are well-placed to give advice to other people. We seem very competent to make our own mistakes, and there's no particular reason why we should export our mistakes to others. Having said that, uh, I suspect what happened is that Germany began to become too rich uh, and not hungry enough. I note, too, that if you go far enough back in German history, no, no, you don't need to go back that far, uh, that Germany could be credited with inventing Western socialism, uh, which is to say there may be something in German culture that's self-defeating. <laughs> The If you look at the success of the German family firm uh, in engineering and precision manufacturing, what you learn is that German society has been absolutely unique in creating individual achievement. Thus far in history, Germans' individual creativity and tenacity uh, has financed their collective stupidity. Uh, in terms of the invention of socialism, in terms of Weimar Germany, And then moving fast forward to the ideological successors to that, Angela Merkel. Um, individually, fantastic people. Collectively, like the rest of the world, by the way, it's not a uniquely German trait, uh, not so smart. German energy policy, uh, I know something about energy and I know something about extractive industries. Uh, and, and by the way, I'm no uh, opponent of alternative energies. I've invested in them. But the idea that you decided to run, uh, run on solar, which is A, intermittent, and B, in a country in Northern Europe where the sun doesn't shine that much, uh, seems odd, uh, particularly given the German masteries of physics. Uh, the idea that if the goal was uh, affordable baseline uh, economic power for the German economic engine that didn't generate particulate pollution uh, and didn't uh, generate carbon, the idea that Germany decided to emphasize lignite coal as opposed to nuclear power seems very odd to me. <laughs> very, very odd to me. This isn't to suggest, by the way, that American policy isn't at least equally odd, <laughs> but you asked me to describe Germany's problems as opposed to America's problems. <laughs> so I, uh, I decided that I would do that. Uh, if you look at the amazing success of the German diaspora around the world, and if you look at the amazing success that Germany enjoyed literally rising from the ashes of World War II to become a pre preeminent economic power, what I think you learn is that the German family and the German individual 
uh, are uniquely placed uh, to be the authors of German prosperity. Uh, unfortunately, the tendency towards collectivism uh, in Germany is pronounced, uh, I think, afforded paradoxically by the amazing financial achievements of German families and individuals. In other words, unlike many other countries, Germany hitherto has been able to afford to be stupid. Uh, there have been some penalties that Germany paid for that. World War I was one. World War II was another. <laughs> and I would suggest that forums like the World Economic Forum uh, are the preparation uh, <laughs> for another German failure. I hope not. Yeah, I hope not too. But uh, as you already said, we are we have an uh, economy economy that relies on cheap energy. But we have, I think, the, the cost intensive uh, energy of of whole Europe. So um, yep, there's a big problem over here. But uh, Rick, let's zoom out a little out of Germany and have a look at the whole world. I mean, we see conflicts in Russia, conflicts in the Red Sea. And to me, it seems to be a fight between the Eastern and the Western world, right? We do have the BRICS turning their backs on the US. Uh, we do see de-dollarization. And Rick, where will that lead us to? What will happen to gold? But more importantly, what will happen to the people, especially in the, in the G7 countries? Will there be a huge change for us in the future? Uh, yes, there will be a huge change. You asked me a whole bunch of questions there. I'll try to remember them as best a 71-year-old can. The conflict between the East and the West, uh, let's start that. I think there's less and less differentiation between the East and the West. Uh, I think that, that trying to define as an example the United States as a non-statist, even non-fascist economy is wrong. Uh, I don't believe that countries have friends. I believe that their leaders and their elites have interest. A and there seems to be conflict uh, between the so-called Eastern leaders, be they Russian, be they Chinese, be they Iranian, and the Western leaders. Um, the multipolarization that I see is probably a good thing. I don't think with 8 billion people, there is one answer. I think there's 8 billion answers. And my preference, rather than having 150 sovereigns, would be for there to be 8 billion sovereigns. But nobody asked me, really, uh, how I want to see things working out. But my hope is that we continue to talk to each other. Uh, the idea that we decide, we, meaning the Americans, or, or NATO, decide to vilify the Russians, irrespective of how reprehensible we feel their policies may be in certain circumstances, that we need to continue to talk. Uh, that we need to find common ground, that we need to find a way not to kill each other, that we need to find a way uh, to back away from the threat of nuclear contact. When the Russians make the point that with the dismantling or the so-called dismantling of the Iron Curtain, and particularly around the reunification of Germany, that NATO made specific promises to the Russians Uh, about the eastward expansion or the lack of eastward expansion of NATO, and then reneged on those problems in six months, those promises in six months. The idea that the entire responsibility for the conflict in Ukraine rests on Russia is perhaps faulty. Mm -hmm. uh, we suggest to the Russians and the Russians suggest to the West that both interfered in the political processes in Ukraine. And they're both right. <laughs> or depending on your point of view, they're yeah. both wrong. Yeah, uh, I, I'm not engaging in this discussion to talk to you about right or wrong. I'm, discu I'm discussing the fact that there is some legitimacy to both points of view. And we need to continue to talk and we need to find a way not to fight. Uh, we need to understand that each has interests. <laughs> and at least from each side's point of view, their interests are legitimate. We need to find a way to find some common ground. That traditionally, I think, has been through trade. Uh, and I find sanctions probably very counterproductive, counterproductive two ways, counterproductive morally, because we need to engage more, uh, counterproductive practically too. Uh, let's look at the sanctions around Russian uranium or the sanctions around Russia at all. During the period of sanctions, Russian exports of uranium to the United States doubled. <laughs> uh, and if they didn't double, if we banned Russian uranium, Russian uranium would simply go to India or China. And Australian and Canadian uranium that went to India and China would come to the United States. <laughs> This is all fairly simple stuff. And I think we need to view it uh, like that. Now, with regards to the U.S. dollar, 
the second part of your question, I think. Yeah. Uh, my friend Doug Casey famously calls the U.S. dollar the prettiest mare at the slaughterhouse, uh, which is to say that despite widespread predictions of the dollar's decline, the dollar has gotten a little bit stronger every year for many, many, many years. It is not, I assure you, as an American, because of the continued dominance of the world economy by the United States. Rather, it's because the race to the bottom uh, is one where other countries are beating the United States. As self-destructive as we are, we seem to be less self-destructive than other people. When you look at a replacement for the U.S. dollar, you, you need to look at a replacement for an economy that has 23% of the world's savings and investment assets. For the next 20 years, it can't be done. <laughs> you need to look for capital markets that are as transparent uh, as the U.S. with free convertibility of the currency and absolute transparency with regards to the statement of accounts. Can't be done. Uh, you need to find uh, a currency with the liquidity of the U.S. Treasury market and the U.S. dollar. Can't be done. What I found when I was selling in my active career before my so-called retirement, when I was selling investment products to sovereign wealth funds, and the biggest investors in the world, uh, in particular in Asia, uh, I, I would go and I would see that U.S. Treasuries were an important part uh, of their financial holdings. And I, and I sort of said after I got to know these people, so listen, uh, as an American, I'm very flattered. You guys send us cars and steel and computers, and we send you back pieces of paper with dreams printed on them. From my point of view, this is a hell of a trade, and it's very flattering, but why do you do this? Uh, I mean, it, it, it seemed to me almost like we're selling you lies, uh, given our current account. And I remember very well uh, one of my counterparties looking at me and smiling and saying, Mr. Rule, what you say is, of course, in the long term true. But your lies are deep and liquid lies. They're the best lies that we're told. <clears throat> and the consequence of that is that we own U.S. Treasuries because we don't have a second choice. In this conversation, I followed up by saying, do you trust us? And my counterpart said, oh, no, but we trust you more than we trust each other. Uh, Doug Casey, again, famously said, the U.S. dollar is an I owe you nothing. The euro, by contrast, is a who owes you nothing. Uh, and the BRICS, uh, given the lack of transparency uh, and the lack of solvency, are uh, nobody owes you anything. One of the reasons I think that you've seen an increase in the gold price uh, has to do with foreign central bank buying. The foreign central banks are buying an asset that doesn't have a current yield because they understand that it's a store of wealth and a medium of exchange that doesn't require any trust in the counterparty. They've learned because of the weaponization of the U.S. dollar, both through the confiscation of $300 billion of U.S. treasuries held by the Russians, but more specifically through the U.S. control of the SWIFT banking system, that despite the fact that they want to do business in U.S. dollars and can't do business in U.S. dollars, uh, that the only reasonable medium of exchange and store of value at their level is gold. At the end of the day, uh, the Russians, uh, pardon me, the Chinese don't want to end up with 20 billion rubles. <laughs> mm -hmm. How can they spend them? What does Russia produce that China needs other than, say, natural gas and iron? Uh, and the Brazilians uh, don't want to end up with a couple billion remnimbi. Uh, the only medium of exchange that the world has right now, which has the liquidity and the transparency, is the U.S. dollar. And that will change only very, very, very slowly. By the way, the enemy of the U.S. dollar is not China. It's not Russia. It's not Iran. The enemy of the U.S. dollar is the U.S. Congress. The only people who could wreck a franchise as great as the U.S. dollar is the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for your answer on that. 
Uh, but Rick, let's switch to the investing part. We've already touched base on on <laughs> great right. We already touched base on on gold. Uh, we've seen uh, a good increase in the gold price. I think we've had a new all-time high in all major currencies. But uh, we both invest into mining stocks in the resource base, and we still don't really see those uh, companies going up. The space is still pretty pretty. Yeah, bloody to 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 call it like that. What must uh, happen to really get more money into our resource base? What has to happen until everybody or everything breaks out again? Three answers to that. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, if you look at history, uh, in the period of the 1970s, you saw the gold price advance for four years before you saw the gold stocks advance. Uh, I, I think that's important to note. Uh, many people are impatient and think that as a consequence of an increased gold price. We should inc see uh, increased gold share prices, and we will, but we won't see that we won't see it soon. The second thing is that the author of the poor regard that investors have for the gold mining industry is the gold mining industry. There have been sins <laughs> in that industry. Uh, if you look back as an example to the period 2000 to 2010. The gold price in U.S. dollar terms moved from $250 to over $1,900, a sevenfold increase. And the free cash flow per share of the XAU declined. It took real management skill to turn a sevenfold increase in the selling price of the product into declining free cash flow per share. Yeah. And the industry has begun to, but needs to continue to reform itself. I would suggest to you that investors bear most of the blame. When investors think about gold stocks, they think about the decade of the 70s, the most explosive up period in, in the history of gold mining stocks. And so they look for companies that exhibit leverage to the price of gold. Ironically, it's the marginal companies, the companies that have the lowest profit margins, that have the highest cost, that exhibit the best margin increases. When the gold price increases, so investors have been taught and in 50 years have looked at the market for leverage, which is to say they've searched out marginal companies. This is pathologically stupid. Uh, we need to look at mining companies that are good businesses, and we need to look at the increase in gold price as icing on the cake. I would go so far as to say if you invest in the sector, the sector itself, senior gold miners or junior mining companies, you will over two decades go broke. Mm -hmm. What you have to do is look at the whole sector and look at the 5% of the best issuers in that sector. Because despite the very poor corporate performance of the sector, uh, individual companies have generated so much performance that they've added uh, legitimacy and including a, 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 an occasionally luster to a sector which has for 50 years been a serial underperformer. Mm -hmm. Now, the gold stocks will run again. They will. Uh, it will take time. Most investors won't have the courage to buy the stocks before the run. Most investors will, because of their greed, after the stocks have run, buy them, which is to say uh, it will be the price performance that justifies the gold stock narrative. To make money and resources, which are capital intensive cyclical businesses, you have to be a contrarian or you are going to be a victim. The investors who do the work now uh, and come to understand which are the better companies, not just the marginal ones that have the most leverage to gold, and act on it before the gold run. The equivalent of the investors who invested in gold stocks in 1971, before the market found out about them uh, in 1974 and 1976, are gonna be the people who make money. <laughs> after the gold price has really run, and after the gold stocks have really run, which I believe is gonna happen, most of the people will become involved in the late stages of the market, and inevitably those people will lose money. 
yes, uh, this is what I think too. You have to do your homework right now, right? It's like a train. Uh, the train is still in the train station, but you can't catch up uh, if the train leaves. Uh, but what are the signs that investors are looking for? I mean, you said it takes time, but is it just time or is there another trigger that we are waiting for? Well, I, I, uh, from a U.S. point of view, uh, the gold price moves because people are concerned about the maintenance of purchasing power in fiat instruments in the U.S. The U.S. savings bond, you know, the U.S. savings, uh, U.S. Treasury securities. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that Americans understand yet the level of deterioration in purchasing power that they're experiencing. Uh, I, I'm not addressing this part of the talk at Germans so much as helping the Germans understand the American problem, which is important to gold. Americans' perception of inflation uh, is geared around something called the Consumer Price Index, the CPI. And the CPI would have Americans believe that their purchasing power is declining by about 2.8% compounded. But the CPI isn't a measure of the deterioration of the purchasing power. It's an index that's created by, if you will, the big thinkers, <laughs> by the Angela Merkels of the world. Uh, it's hedonistically adjusted, uh, which means it's manipulated. Uh, it also doesn't include tax. The idea that a cost of living index didn't include the component that's the most important component in the living cost for American families is farcical. I believe myself that uh, the purchasing power of the basket of goods and services that I consume suggests that the purchasing power of my savings is declining at about 7% compounded. If you own a U.S. 10-year treasury paying you 4.2 in a currency where your purchasing power is declining at 7% compounded, what it means is that you're losing 2.8% a year. You can do that for a while. I go back again to 1967, when inflation really reared its ugly head in the United States. But Americans didn't notice the impact of inflation until 1974, after the gas price at the pump had more than doubled, after the price of food had doubled, after the price of rents had doubled. During the decade of the 1970s, the purchasing power of the US dollar fell by 80%. Not surprisingly, the gold price soared. As more Americans come to recognize the deterioration of the purchasing power of their savings held in conventional U.S. dollar-denominated savings instruments, my belief is that gold inevitably will do well. Gold will need to lead. Then the gold stocks will follow. It's important to remember that there's historical precedent for this. You know, the writing was on the wall in the U.S. in 1967. Nobody gave a damn until 1974. When they began to give a damn, the lid came off the thing. I don't own gold, uh, Jan, because I believe that the gold price in U.S. dollar terms is going to go from 2000 to 2200 or 2500 I couldn't care less. That's mm -hmm. background noise to me. I own it because I remember the decade of the 70s when the gold price ran 30-fold. I remember the decade 2000 to 2010, where the gold price ran sevenfold. I own gold because I'm actually afraid, afraid that in U.S. dollar terms, the gold price is going to go to $7,000 or $8,000. Afraid because that will be an expression of trouble. And I'm 71 years of age. Uh, I'm happy. I'm rich. I don't want to experience trouble. Uh, I just believe that I need to ensure myself for the contingency that that trouble will find me. That's why I own gold. Wow. Yep. Strong words, uh, Rick. Thank you very much for that. And I think we all have to look at gold as a, yeah, as a, a purchasing power um, instrument, right? And not just as a speculation. Um, thank you very much. Um, we now talked about gold, but obviously there's more when it comes to metals and resource uh, uh, or, or metals. Yeah, right. So we've seen already a big run in the uranium space, Rick, uh, which was yeah kind of clear because we were in a deficit for quite a while. 
Now we are also in a deficit uh, when it comes to silver. We will need more tons and tons of copper in the future. Um, there's also more metals that we that we need in the future. Uh, what kind of um, investment opportunities are lo you looking at at the moment? What's your favorite commodity? Well, there's a whole universe out there, which is wonderful. <clears throat> Let's talk about uranium first, because it's 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 an important teaching tool. In 2022, nobody wanted to own uranium, just like nobody wants to own silver today. They said, why would you own it? It, haven't, it hasn't moved. The fact that it hasn't moved is precisely why you would own it. It was cheap. In capital-intensive cyclical businesses, you are either a contrarian, willing to buy stuff when they're cheap, or you're going to be a victim, meaning you're going to pay too much. So you choose. Do you want to make money or not? If you want to make money, you have to buy a commodity that's out of favor particularly a commodity where the commodity's utility to humankind is such that we can't do without it, which was certainly true with uranium, irrespective of President Biden or Angela Merkel. Um, we were selling the stuff for 20 bucks a pound US, and we were making it fully loaded for 60 bucks a pound. Being dumb miners, we were trying to make it up on volume, losing 40 bucks a pound. The price had to go up to the point where the industry was earning its cost of capital, or the lights would go out, even in Germany. It's that simple. Having the intelligence and the courage to buy stuff that has to go up is the key to making money in natural resources. Finding good businesses and good business leaders. Now, that tells me because the biggest business that I see out there that's out of favor is still the oil industry. <laughs> um, on a global basis, because the big thinkers of the world uh, believe and would have you believe that peak oil demand will occur in 2030, uh, people are discounting unduly the free cash flows associated with the oil and gas business. I believe that peak oil demand occurs in 2065 or 2070, 40 years from now. After all, how would all the big thinkers fly all those private jets to Davos to tell you to drive less if they didn't use oil? Because of the political headwinds that oil is facing, the oil industry, particularly the state-owned oil firms, are underinvesting in sustaining capital by about a billion dollars a day. This means that their ability to produce two years out or three years out is constrained, which paradoxically means that the oil price will stay higher for longer. The best promoters that the oil industry have, Prime Minister Trudeau, President Biden, the World Economic Forum, making sure that I enjoy higher prices for longer. I guess I'm indebted to them. Uh, if you believe in that thesis, I think that you need to own the oil companies, but only the oil companies that are bucking the trend and are making enough sustaining capital investments that they will still be able to generate good free cash flow three years from now, four years from now, five years from now. What else is out of favor? Well, rare earths are out of favor. They were held in very high regard three or four years ago, too high regard, and they disappointed people. Now people hate rare earths, but they aren't rare. They're out there to find. The yeah. fact that we don't like them, the fact that the circumstances that made them popular, which has to do with the geopolitics of the conflict between China and the West, still exist. What's changed is that the share prices have fallen by 70 or 80%. From the point of view of investors, that's a good thing. But investors don't have, they haven't done the work, so they don't have the courage of their conviction. If you went to buy a winter coat in Germany, hopefully, first of all, you'd buy it in the summer when nobody else perceived the needs and they were cheap. But you wouldn't seek to buy the most expensive coat you could. Uh, if there was a, vo a coat that was on sale for, say, 80% off, you'd think this is a good deal. Well, Rare yeah. earth stocks are 80% off. But when it's financial assets that are on sale, we don't want them. It's only when physical assets are on sale that we want them. This is stupid. One must be a contrarian or one is going to be a victim. I 100% agree with you, Rick. Uh, that's what I'm trying to teach people. That's like having a discount in a, in a shopping mall, right? Um, maybe just a quick yes or no thing. We talked about things that nobody cares about. Uh, lithium. Will we see lithium rise again or are we at the downtrend and will the downtrend continue? Just a quick thing, if it's possible. <laughs> we will see lithium rise again, but we won't, see it, we won't see it rise for three or four years. 
an awful lot of money was spent looking for lithium, and we found an awful lot of it. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the bottleneck never had to do with elemental lithium. Alba Marley uh, and uh, SQM had lots. It had to do with the fact that we didn't have enough processing capacity to turn that lithium into lithium chemicals. We've developed that processing capacity. We need to digest, and it'll take three or four years, the increase in supply that we've created as a consequence of the high prices. I suspect that three or four years from now, investors will look at lithium like a four-letter word. They'll look at it as, as a pejorative. I'm, I don't know if that translates into German. But when people really, truly hate lithium uh, and lithium mines are getting shut down, when the industry is in liquidation and when investors think, I wish I never heard of lithium, that's when you need to get back on the train. Then it's getting interesting, yeah. Thank you, Rick. Um, we already touched base on how the industry works. And there's a difference between you and me, an obvious thing, um, that you are just a little bit older than I am. Um, and in your generation, investing into mining industry, that's a totally normal thing, right? But in my generation, uh, when I come to PDEC, uh, Rick, I am by far the youngest person in the room. So, and to me, it doesn't really seem like the industry cares about younger people. That's just a feeling that we, I don't really see the interest uh, that comes to us. So what does it need to bring more of us in the sector? I mean, we do need younger people. We do need fresh money. What do you think the industry has to do? Well, I need to tell you that through rural investment media, uh, 50% of my new subscribers in the last uh, five years have been under 50. Uh, 35% of them have been female. 40% of them have been non-Caucasian. The audience is out there, but as you point out, we haven't engaged them. In terms of raising money, the industry hasn't gone to young people because young people don't have any. Uh, it's old people that have money. Uh, it's as though you were talking to an evangelical cheat, uh, preacher. Yeah. The easiest way to raise money for the church is to pass the collection plate through the choir. <laughs> but you need to expand the congregation. Now, we need to talk about two different tracks. The industry itself is ardently courting young people to go to work in it. There is a skills gap. In 1970, the School of Geological Engineering at the University of British Columbia had 280 entrants. It was regarded as a great job. Last year, it had nine. There is a 40-year gap, at least among Caucasian males, in skills. The industry needs young people in the worst way. And the industry is going to have to compete with those young people by giving them good lives and paying them a lot. And ultimately, the market will work. That scarcity of labor and the fact that the industry will have to compensate labor extravagantly will cause young people to be interested <laughs> in the mining space out of their own self-interest. By the way... Young Indian students are interested today. Young Chinese students are interested today. Young Mexican students are interested today. Young students from societies that haven't offered the other paths to advancement that Western countries have are already experiencing an amazing upsurge in an interest in careers in extractive industries. You and I have been spoiled. <laughs> We haven't had to look at something heavy dirty and dangerous like mining because we've had too many opportunities to talk into a camera and make money. But in uh, societies where those opportunities haven't been as available to us, uh, there is already the upsurge in interest that you're looking for. Uh, in 2010 and 2011, The firm that I uh, then worked for and was the largest shareholder of, Sprott Inc., mm -hmm. actively began to look at how do we find young investors? How do we engage them? Our audience literally, not figuratively, is dying. Old, bald, white, fat guys. Dying. How do we reach the next generation? And we labored over this. We thought about it. We convened focus groups. We did all kinds of stupid stuff. When I began to engage in social media as a very cheap way to find, to discuss 
uh, and reach my own audience, my existing audience. What I found was that by engaging young people where they already were, <laughs> I found them. I found my footing among young people because young people didn't engage me the way that old people engaged me. Old people engaged me by reading the Oil and Gas Journal, by mm -hmm. reading the Wall Street Journal, yeah. by uh, watching what was then called FNN, Financial News Network. Young people were there to engage uh, on YouTube, at LinkedIn, uh, by making my own videos, by appearing in interviews like this. Um, this is really, truly easy to do, but the industry hasn't done it because the industry is lazy. Uh, they want to go back to the old traditional sources of money, which, by the way, the industry sins uh, have caused those pools of money to decline. <laughs> and those people are dying. Uh, we have no second choice but to engage young people where they are. There's huge benefits. The industry says it's hard. So what? <laughs> it's hard. Nothing else works. I have no problem engaging young audiences. My audience is growing between 35 and 50 people a day because I engage them where we are and I engage them with a message that's relevant. I don't say to people, you should buy gold. I say to young people uh, in the United States, entitlements, which is to say benefits to old people, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, have a net present value of liability of $120 trillion. My generation has voted itself all these cool benefits and forgot to pay for it. Your generation gets to pay for it. Yeah. You need to defend yourself from me, and I'm going to show you how to do it. That right. message uh, addressing the reality of the young people face from their point of view, not from your own point of view, uh, selling from the point of view of establishing benefit to buyer. The first lesson that you learn in selling is how we do it. And I'm absolutely positively confident that we're going to do it. Let's hope so. I mean, as you already said, it's not hard to engage young people. You just have to try it. You just have to do it, right? And you're already doing it. We already talked about uh, Rural Investment Media, your company where you try to educate people on, you know, trying it, you're doing it. And you also have two upcoming events that we should talk about. Your virtual bootcamp on the 20th of April and also the well-known Rural Symposium on Natural Resource Investing. Rick, what can investors and in attendees expect from these two conferences of you? Actually, let's talk about four things. Mm -hmm. The first is rural media itself. If you like what I have to say about natural resources and you want to make some money, uh, list your natural resource stocks. Go to the, go to the website, ruralinvestmentmedia.com, and list your natural resource stocks. For no obligation, no fee, I'll personally rank them, one to ten. I'll comment on individual issues, so I think my comments might have value. Take that information and go to the rural uh, classroom. We have 200 hours of instructive programming there. Uh, how to understand geology, how to analyze mining companies, how to understand financial statements, how to understand markets. It's all free. Invest in yourself before you invest your money, your time and treasure in mining. Then go to the real symposiums. Once every three months, we do a deep dive on some topic. We did eight and a half hours on uranium. We did eight hours on silver. We did royalty and streaming companies. The upcoming one is in a really hated sector, exploration and prospect developers, which I love. I love hate. We're going to spend eight hours on this topic, a deep, deep, deep dive. But importantly, you'll have access to the recordings for a year. That's important because you won't get everything out of the eight hours that we have to give. It's just too dense. Costs you 99 US dollars. The symposium takes place on your computer or on your phone. If you don't think that I've earned the $99, tell me you want a refund and I'll give you your money back. Gold-plated money back guarantee. But the best service I have is the Natural Resource Investment Symposium. It stood the test of time. It's gone on for almost 30 years. This year, it's in Boca Raton, Florida. By the way, a favorite destination of Germans. <laughs> And I'd love to see you there live, July 7th through 11th. But if it's inconvenient to you, you can, you, you can watch the whole conference via live stream in your own house on your own computer. We have great big picture thinkers who will tell you about the way the world is. 
not the way that the big thinkers <laughs> want you to believe it is. We have analysts and portfolio managers who've been successful for 30 or 40 years in natural resources, not some hack from an investment bank uh, who failed analyzing supermarkets uh, and who failed analyzing technology, but real natural resource investors. Importantly, we have the living legends, people who have built multi-billion dollar companies from scratch, talking about how the lessons they learned building those companies made them better investors. Importantly, at our symposium, the exhibitors are content too, not just advertisers. So no public company is allowed to be an exhibitor that isn't owned in accounts uh, that are owned and managed by the people who put on the conference. It doesn't mean, sadly, that every stock I buy goes up. <laughs> what it does mean is that every single exhibitor has been vetted. We own them, and we own them in size with our own money. Again, you will have access to the, to the recordings of the conference, whether you attend live or on live stream, for a year. And you will need to review those tapes. Again, uh, if you don't believe that I have delivered fair value, email me. Gold-plated money-back guarantee. In 30 years of selling investment products, uh, investor education products, uh, I've had this money-back guarantee in place, and I'm very proud to say I've had to refund less than one-tenth of the tuitions that I've charged. But that notwithstanding, all the financial risk is mine. You invest the time. If you don't think that it was worth your while, you let me know, and I'll give you your money back. Rick, that's uh, just great. Thank you very much for outlining that. And we will have all the links that you uh, viewers need uh, down below in the comments. And you can just go click and uh, yeah, book a ticket for one of Rick's um, events. Pretty interesting. Rick, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure having you. And I'm looking forward to talk to you again pretty soon. And let's hope for some good years for natural resource investing people. Uh, the good years will come of their own volition. Not a problem, not a worry. I look forward to more discussions with you, which you and I will have to arrange. Great. Rick, thank you very much. A pleasure. Thank you.